Like a lot of Americans, I was introduced to Korea through the world of K-pop. I remember on New Year's Eve 2016, my cousin showed me BTS's blood, sweat, and tears and having a spiritual moment. Seeing Jimin with his smoky eyeshadow and the grace with which he moved. Oh, that, that was peak. And he also showed me twice Red Velvet and NCT. I've always been more of a boy group type of girl. Until 2018, I was firmly a BTS head. I explored their discography, watched all their interviews, and fell in love with them as individuals or their personas, rather. We'll get into parasocialism in K-pop later. 2018, EXO's Tempo came out. This is when I fully fell into the K-pop rabbit hole. I dived headfirst into all those groups my cousin introduced me to two years prior. On YouTube, they have these weekly K-pop release videos that I would keep up with. We're talking every week on Sunday. I made sure I was there locked in for 30 minutes straight to know every song that came out in that country. You know, I understand why people are so concerned by k-pop fans now my sister and i would play k-pop games bet you didn't even know that was a thing you could have asked me anything and i could answer it i was the k-pop trivia queen the drama the hit songs the drama among the k-pop youtubers it was all permanently burned into my brain I had my phases of being obsessed with certain group members. With BTS, it fluctuated quite a bit from Jimin to J-Hope to RM to Jungkook. With EXO, I was a loyal Baekhyun fan. His voice is god tier. But there was a period of time when I got really into NCT. As usual, I did the routine. I watched YouTube compilations, interviews, exclusive shows, whatever I needed to fully grasp the dynamic of the group. I quickly decide my bias. Mark, easy, good choice. He's adorable, he's funny, and he's hopefully not currently problematic. NCT has a ton of people, so I think that made some of them definitely fade into the background a lot more than in other groups. Mark, Lucas, and Johnny were much more vocal and loud. Whereas members like Young and Yuta still stood out, but were definitely more quiet. Taeyong was someone I rarely saw talk. At least in the hours of compilation videos I watched, he was never the focus. He just was an average guy in this group who did his part and then sunk into the background. Nothing more, nothing less. So it was to my surprise to see this soft-spoken NCT member in the news cycle four years after I had dropped K-pop all together. Taeyo was exposed for allegedly being an active participant in deep fake porn chat rooms or the Telegram scandal. These men would send non-consensual deep fake images to other chat room members of people they personally knew. And Teo, a public figure, is now being investigated in this case. How could this seemingly normal, under the radar guy be involved in one of the largest global sex crimes involving an estimated 220,000 people? Well, men worldwide are moving increasingly more to the right. For Americans, we may internally view this pendulum swing as a product of internal politics, but it reaches far beyond our borders. It's in Western Europe, it's in Latin America, and now it's in Asia. This global phenomenon has caused extremist radicalization and resulted in this sexist, toxic sludge that a lot of Korean men have made their agenda. About a year and a half ago, I covered Gamergate in one of my favorite video essays to date. It was this movement in Western internet circles that threatened and violated the privacy of women, POCs, or anyone who disagreed with them. Death threats, rape threats, doxing, they did it all. What started as a few people angry about video game journalism turned into an attitude that was adopted by huge internet personalities and co-opted by the far right. This fear of diversity and reactionary sentiment spread far and wide, changing the climate of entire platforms and perspectives of many young men forever. It's about 
eight years since the main Gamergate movement ended, but now we're starting to see the resurgence of a similar energy, whether it be through Andrew Tate and red pill content, immigration hysteria in Western Europe, or reactionary platforms like Hick. Men have once again been captured by the far right. I think through that video we came to understand how that manifests in places like America. But what about in other parts of the world? What does reactionary politics look like for them? It had become my understanding for a while that Korea was an incredibly conservative nation. Their society is dominated by exploitative demonic capitalist families called chaebols. They have insane detrimental beauty standards that determine you should be as pasty and perfect as possible. They have the worst suicide rate of any OECD nation, the widest gender pay gap. It is very clear how dystopian of a society Korea is. While America and Korea are an ocean away, we have heavily influenced their politics, especially with US involvement during the Korean War to stomp out communism and create the perfect pro-capitalist state that would ultimately work in our interest. Well, we created this a country that is so beholden to this ideology that it demonstrates what fully unchecked capitalism looks like, a government and society that is willing to put its people in the crosshairs. Maybe about a year ago, I'm not sure, my life has become a blur, I made a video titled Korea is in their Gamergate era. I think it surrounded this Vice video about this angry, sexist, and so like group that would go to feminist protests and film content harassing these women and this growing gender war within the country. Honestly, when I originally made that video, I thought, uh, this doesn't extend that far. This is just a small minority in the grand scheme. I, I don't know if I believe that anymore. My question is why have men worldwide adopted that attitude? How did this situation turn into a public figure being found liable for sex crimes? And most importantly, how do we solve it? I think the key is in examining South Korea. 꾸준하게 지속적으로 저에게 뭐 영산을 붓겠다 만나면 Anna was raped by her professor at college. She credits the gender equality ministry with saving her life. 저는 그 사건을 겪은 후에 가족들이 지지를 해 주실 줄 알았어요. 좀 오히려 가족들은 좀 수치스럽게 생각을 하시더라고요. Before we get into all of this, I'm going to do a quick plug. Subscribe. I would ultimately eventually like to be able to do YouTube full time. So if you want to help me on that journey of getting there, uh, every subscription counts, you know, that'd be nice. Other ways to support. I have TikTok, Instagram. Uh, we have a Discord where you can connect with your fellow members. Um, it's kind of... We need more people up there. It's kind of dead. Okay, so if you want to help reinvigorate it, keep it alive so I don't delete it. Um, Get on there, interact. You know, sometimes they watch movies and TV shows. You know, fun stuff is happening on there. Then we also have Patreon, where the $5 tier is the most popular. Uh, you can see basically my entire process as I work on videos just like this, from scripts to audio to video drafts to um, just a bunch of exclusive content or you can just give a dollar either on there or on youtube where you get cute emotes so you honestly if it were me i would do the youtube so i could get the emotes put them in chat or not in chat but in the comment section flex on everybody else who doesn't have them you know that's what i would do personally but that's just me but let's get back to the video I first want to take a look at the other side of the aisle. Men are the main perpetrators of violence, but they aren't the only ones who are being radicalized. In a country with extreme record levels of gender inequality in the form of restrictive beauty standards, pay gaps, femicide, and sex crimes, how are the women holding up? In recent years, we've seen the development of a movement among Korean women. 
They call it 4B and it aims to create a world without men. The female only movement calls on its members to not participate in heterosexual relationships, marriage, and reproduction. It may seem like an extreme vision, but what if I told you it's actually not the first of its kind? Sex strikes go all the way back to ancient Greece. Yeah, we're talking about before Jesus was born. In the play Lysitrata, performed 2,500 years ago, the women of Athens withheld sex and took hold of the Parthenon to stop the endless wars. In 2011, another group of women in Colombia used this ancient inspiration to pressure their government to prepare roads. The government in Barbacoa reportedly felt so bad for the men that they caved making this historic strike successful. Eight years prior in Liberia, women organized a multitude of non-violent actions, including a sex strike to stop a civil war. Their leader, Lema Boli, won a Nobel Peace Prize for her actions. While 4B shares a similar strategy, its plan for an absently male utopia is what separates it. 4B stands for four words in Korean that start with B or no. Bihon, refusal of heterosexual marriage. Bichusong, I'm sorry if I say any of these words right, I can't speak Korean, okay? Refusal of childbirth. Bionne, refusal to date. And bisexu, refusal of heterosexual sexual relationships. Some members even refrain from friendships with men, demonstrating their true commitment to the cause. The movement began in 2018 when women in Seoul started organizing public protests. This sparked splinter subgroups within the main movement, like Escape the Corset, which is much more focused on the rejection of beauty standards. Members shaved their heads sometimes on camera, as well as refusing to purchase or wear makeup products. Just to put it into perspective how ingrained these standards are into their culture, Korea is the number one producer of grooming and beauty products. Many Americans have also begun to rely on imported Korean goods since the country is known for its high quality products and extensive number of sunscreen filters. Stores like TJ Maxx have entire sections full of this stuff, so you can only imagine how prideful Korea itself is when it comes to beauty. I will also mention that they have a really big plastic surgery culture. I believe I, they sometimes will even gift like nose jobs to teenagers whenever they for their birthday, you know. However, a year after 4B began, a 2019 survey showed a shift within young women. 24% of women in their 20s reported spending less on beauty products, saying they just didn't feel it was necessary. 4B would have been much smaller back then, so I really doubt it was as a result of their presence, but it does demonstrate some sort of change within Korean women. They are simply tired of carrying this unnecessary weight. A cut article that extensively covered the 4B movement echoes a similar sentiment. Many realized that the pressure and pain that they felt were the product of the patriarchy and not their fault. For many, this is the only way they can feel as if they have any sort of autonomy, by completely cutting themselves off from the source of their pain. At that point, the only thing that separates 4B women from regular Korean women is their method of achieving said freedom. Korea's astronomical gender pay gap causes economics to be a high priority for 4 beers. They have created yet another subgroup called WITH or Women in Hell that specifically focuses on economics. Members tell each other which banks have the lowest interest rates, post job listings, and financial tips. When women are more economically influential, then it's possible that the political parties will listen to women as important voters, Han added. But until then, I feel like women will still be utilized. Their bodies will be utilized to reproduce. As with any movement, infighting is ever present. Many are divided on whether women should be friends with men. Lots of four beers have turned to lesbian relationships as an alternative, sparking a whole new set of questions. Do lesbian relationships resexualize women, destroy feminism, privatize relationships? Or is it necessary for this utopian society without men? As per usual, in any feminist movement, there's transphobia. <laughs> Online members for chat rooms require verification of sex by posting a photo, which can lead to discrimination 
against trans women. Some ex Behone members make trad wife content on YouTube disparaging the community, claiming they've seen the light and have returned to heterosexuality. Despite their inner rifts, all of the 4B are united on one thing. They take this much more extreme approach to conquering the patriarchy, writing off men as beyond repair in the country itself is hopelessly patriarchal. Members mostly stay within their own bubbles, creating safe spaces. They use cacao to talk and organize protests, which primarily stay within the range of online activism or public demonstrations. And if you look at the data and the events within Korea, it's hard not to have some level of sympathy or understanding for how they came to this conclusion. As alluded to earlier, Korea suffers from femicides, spy cam sex crimes, revenge porn, and widespread dating violence. That violence at times extends to minors as well. A 2016 survey by the Ministry of Gender, Equality, and Family found the incidence of intimate partner violence at 41.5%, significantly higher than the global average of 30%. This violence mostly results in jail suspensions and fees, which creates this two-tier justice system among men and women. In fact, some of the initial 4B protests were in response to a 25-year-old woman who was sentenced to 10 months in prison in court-ordered sexual violence counseling for taking a non-consensual photo of a nude male model. These protests weren't to excuse that woman's obviously wrong actions, but to call out the government's double standard. Why aren't men who commit similar acts given the same sentence? Shouldn't justice involve holding everyone to the same standard, or has justice become purely about hypocrisy and vengeance? It's injustices like these that have once again created an overlap among 4B and normie Korean women. They are now not only united on the front against beauty standards, but men all together. The cut reported even non-members saying, I can't imagine marrying a Korean man. There is a growing divide between men and women in all areas of life, 4B or not. So how do we get to a point like this? Femicide and rampant sex crimes don't just materialize out of thin air. With so many Korean men captured by this ideology, this isn't just a coordinated act of evil, but a culmination of resentment and anger. Nothing, of course, excuses these horrific acts, but how could we ever solve it if we never acknowledge the source? And the source in question is very similar to our own homegrown radicalization. Globally, it seems men are moving to the right due to a lack of future prospects and worsening material conditions. Similarly to America, Korea's housing prices are skyrocketing. The country has also an insanely competitive job market and limited university slots. Recently, women have comprised the majority of those spots, with Korean women being three-fourths more likely to be educated compared to two-thirds of Korean men, another shared statistic with America. Due to Korea's homogenous nature, the only major societal fault line is on the basis of gender. Women are normally expected to drop out of the workforce when they get married or pregnant, but more and more women are opting to stay in the competitive workforce. Around 2015, just around Gamergate's start, this resentment began to manifest in online forums. They labeled women kimchi nyo or kimchi woman, a phrase used to describe selfish women who seek to exploit their partners and up are obsessed with themselves. An online community called Eelb grew in popularity, creating this echo chamber for angry men to scream into the void. They expressed their irritation with women having the audacity to ask for more rights when they aren't even forced into the military service. Like, how dare they? This interpretation of women as gold digging and shallow only continued to grow as they slung their horror stories at each other reigniting all of this unruly hatred. Many started to take it one step further. Instead of hiding in a chat room, they confronted these women, let them know exactly how they feel. Communication is key, right? They were still hiding behind a screen, but engaged in misogynistic harassment strategies like trolling, mockery, and abusive language. At the same time, feminists were creating their own group, Agalia and coined the term Hanam Chung, or sexist, ugly man. The societal discourse, at least online, was beginning to create an incel-like divide where neither side could tolerate the other. 
In 2016, a young man murdered a woman in a sole public restroom. In a statement, he claimed the woman had always ignored him, compelling him to carry out this moment of rebellion. It's a story that reminds me of incels like Elliot Roger, who in such a selfish, disgusting manner ended others' lives out of vengeance. They were grieving the loss of something they had never even received, perceived love and affection. You girls have never been attracted to me. I don't know why you girls aren't attracted to me, but I will punish you all for it. It's an injustice, a crime, because I don't know what you don't see in me. I'm the perfect guy, and yet you throw yourselves at all these obnoxious men instead of me. The supreme gentleman. I think Elliot's video before he went on to do the Isla Vista killings describes this end point some men reach. You'll hear him praise himself and uplift himself as this superior being several times throughout the video. But all of that is a farce. It's a ruse, a mask he puts on to hopefully shield his unbearable insecurity. No one who values themselves and their life would throw it all away in such a fashion. They wouldn't have even sat down to make this video. This sloppy attempt to save face is really the only last piece of humanity he exhibits. All those girls that I've desired so much, they would have all rejected me and looked down upon me as an inferior man if I ever made a sexual advance towards them. You will finally see that I am, in truth, the superior one, the true alpha male. You also hear him tell the camera, if I can't have this love and affection, I'll just slaughter these women who owe it to me. I've always wondered why stalkers often enact violence on people if they love them or have some sort of affection towards them. And this video gives insight into that mindset. It's vengeance for rejection or maybe even vengeance against themselves. Now, of course, not all of these men commit such heinous acts as Elliot and the 2016 killer in Seoul, but they start from a similar source of frustration. Both of these individuals didn't necessarily start at the beginning of their journey knowing they were going to kill someone. I mean, Elliot very clearly, I would assume, has so antisocial personality disorder, but that doesn't inherently mean he'll kill someone. There was frustration that built into anger that built into violence. And as we get into some of the bigger cases in Korea, you'll see that there's also a connection of dehumanization that occurs. And there's no better starting point for dehumanization than the police refusing to label the 2016 murder as a hate crime. Yes, despite the suspect very clearly outlining his motivation and thought process, the police just weren't willing to prosecute it as such. This only invigorated Magalia and other feminist chat rooms to build more of a coalition. For weeks, they began to express their outrage to each other, which over time built into this grassroots, digitally focused form of feminism, something the country had never seen before. Throughout the years, this sexist governance only continued to escalate. In December of 2016, the Korean fertility rate dropped to 1.2 births per woman, the lowest of any country in the world. Now it sits at 0 0.81. Did the Korean government do to tackle such a growing concern? They made a national birth map outlining their expectations for how many children women should have. Obviously, that didn't work out so well as we know today. Turns out when you're sexist, it just makes people want to fuck less. Then they were granted with the absolute gem that is Yoon Sok Yo. Oh, what a prize he is. The incel adjacent president won on an anti-feminist message and pledged he would abolish the Ministry of Gender Inequality. Yoon is quoted saying, structural sexism is no longer exist. Whoa, that's, that's crazy because Korea has some of the most atrocious statistics involving women I have ever seen in my life. Why does gender pay gap, rampant rates of femicide and sex crimes, a whole movement where women are choosing to eliminate men from their lives. Yeah, but I, I don't get it. They don't even have to serve in the military. I don't see what the problem is. Yoon delivered on his promises too. In 2024, the ministry saw a budget cut along with the advocacy center for online sexual abuse victims. This funding is crucial to these institutions work, especially as with all the data, you might've guessed that their workload has only increased. From personal experience living here in America, I know that having leaders like this 
only fans the flames. When Trump came into office in 2016, we saw this emboldened attitude within the white supremacy groups and Nazis, who ended up doing things like Charlottesville. These are ideologies and individuals who existed before and after Trump, but there's no denying his anti-immigrant rhetoric and virulently racist comments made white people feel a little too comfortable. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. Our attitudes towards subjects like immigration are reverting to like the 1950s. Even Republicans in the 80s weren't this against immigration. Ronald Reagan did amnesty for God's sakes. In a normal political environment, you would have the opposition party pushing back against harmful rhetoric like this, but instead you just get them moving more and more to the right and becoming more like Trump. But anyways, um, before I go off on a tangent about American politics, let me just say that I think Yoon is bringing a similar energy to Korea. And this is something the women of Korea have echoed. In a joint statement last week, women's rights groups said the root cause of recurring digital sexual abuses is sexism. They blamed President Yoon Seok kyols government for failing to recognize that and letting the problem grow. So while Western radicalization often devolves into blaming the Jews or black people or anyone who isn't the default Fortnite skin, Korean radicalization goes down one track, resenting women. The first major story I ever heard detailing this egregious sexist dehumanization was Burning Sun. The main figure at the center of the case was Lee Sung Hyun or Sung Lee of Big Bang. If you aren't familiar with them, Big Bang was an incredibly popular hip hop group that emerged during the second generation of K-pop. They're most known probably for their song Bang 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 and their main rapper G Dragon. I think he's pretty popular globally. Outside of the group, Sung Lee began to take on leadership roles, one of which involved managing the club Burning Sun. Over the course of three years, it would slowly be revealed that Sung Lee, along with multiple other K-pop stars, were involved in facilitating a huge sex crime scandal. It started briefly in 2016 when singer Jung Jun Young was involved in a brief scandal. The police accused him of non-consensually filming a sex act. The management company C9 Entertainment released a statement dismissing the charges as a misunderstanding. Eventually, he was acquitted, putting the case to rest. Fast forward to 2019 when the entire thing exploded. In February, a man named Mr. Kim was assaulted by Burning Sun employees after attempting to help a woman who was sexually harassed. Initially, the club tried to cover it up by claiming management kicked him out because he was actually the one who was harassing women. It became all the harder to believe Burning Sun when Dispatch, a Korean me media entity, leaked alleged chats discussing date rape between Burning Sun employees. Sung Lee took to Instagram to ensure his followers that he had low-level involvement in all of this. Low-level. That's interesting. Sung Lee had trouble though getting all of the allegations off his back as pictures of him and a woman named Anna began to circulate online. It became well established that she was dealing drugs to the club. Not related to any sex crimes obviously, but it's still awfully suspicious and also awfully illegal, especially in Korea. The country has pretty stringent policies and social taboos even associated with drugs like marijuana. Later that month though, SBS, Korea's NBC, if you will, reported that Sung Lee was actually involved in sex crimes associated with the club. He allegedly bribed investors with prostitutes through Kakao Talk. Jung Jun Young, the same guy from the 2016 scandal, was also a part of that group chat. At this point, for their own protection, Sung Lee's management company, YG, had to come to his defense to calm the waters, somehow move the news cycle away from him. But despite their best efforts, YG stock still fell 4.95%. In March, there was motion. Sung Lee was booked on a prostitution charge and later that day announced his retirement on Insta. After a second round of questioning, it was revealed that Sung Lee reportedly sent women to Japan for escort services. His fate was sealed. More information was revealed about Jun Young's 2016 scandal. Reports from SBS alleged he shared those non-consensual videos 
with other celebrities. At least 10 women are revealed to be victims with the timeline dating back to 2015. On the 12th, Jun Young was booked on all charges. The detail that tied together all of these events from 2015 to now was an alleged connection between the police and Burning Sun. The whistleblower of the group chat was the individual who revealed the information sparking a police corruption case. The commissioner general later confirmed tying the corruption to Jun Young's 2016 case. Police involvement was the very reason he was initially let off. An officer allegedly requested the forensic team to claim they didn't restore the singer's phone, which was key evidence. The commissioner's office announced an investigation into themselves makes sense, as well as a nationwide investigation into drugs, sexual assault, and hidden cameras. There are so many intricate details in this case that span months. Billboard has an entire article detailing every piece of known information from the case. It's linked down below if you want to go through it and read everything. While it was quite difficult, I tried my best to compile the most pressing bits. Multiple K-pop stars along with their investors and external collaborators facilitated an environment for assault and harassment in their club, distributed non-consensual videos of women, and participated in bribery in a sex trafficking ring. Quite heinous stuff that these public figures many admired and cherished were participating in behind the scenes. What's even more shocking is what comes next. John Jun Young, sentenced to six years in prison for gang rape and the distribution of inappropriate videos, only served five. Sung Lee actively participated in Jun Young's chat rooms along with sex trafficking, gambling, and violation of food safety laws, sentenced to three years only served 18. Another K-pop star, Choi Jong-hoon of FT Island, was involved in two gang rapes associated with the club, sentenced to five years, only served two after a settlement with the victims. A few others were allegedly involved but not convicted. Roy Kim, Lee Jong-hyun of CN Blue, Young Jong-hyung of Highlight, and Eddie Kim. It's been four years, which is crazy to say. There's a lot to pick apart from this case, but from the details, we begin to see inklings of radicalization peek through. In the chat rooms, they not only sent photos and videos of women non-consensually, but also rated the sex with the woman. I mean, that is just play misogynistic dehumanization of women. Boiling individuals you have abused down to this transactional experience involves a lifetime of social conditioning and privilege and just an inundation of sexist rhetoric to do such a thing. Also important to add that crimes like these, while sexual in nature, are a lot of the time more about power than any sense of pleasure. I believe I broke it down in my carotid video as well, but there's this dynamic of domination that intrigues people like this. They have put individuals who they might already have a physical or social power imbalance with in an even more vulnerable state. Now it's not just the act of the abuse that gives them power, but in this case, the indefinite material. They will now always have this manifestation of the abuse that they can hold over you or use to continuously feel their ego. The police corruption case in itself shows how the system encourages and enables the continuation of this behavior. The superintendent had a secret connection to the wealthy businessman Yoon In Suk of Yudi Holdings, who was an active participant in the chat rooms. The police also covered up Choi Jong Kun's drunk driving case, Jun Young's sexual assault case, and ultimately failed the victims by not properly investigating the police force. And barely punishing them. Maybe I'm just too Amerabrained and used to people getting an astronomically long sentences, but 18 months for sex trafficking? Are we okay? I very rarely advocate for higher sentences, but for such horrific crimes, they shouldn't have gotten away with two years for gang rape. Maybe, maybe that's just me. I really doubt though that these people are rehabilitated. Not that the prison system aptly does that anyways, but I doubt these people are doing mandatory sexual assault counseling or any meaningful reform. This case not only shows the enabling of sexism in the patriarchy, but also classism. The police opted to protect the wealthy over the victims time and time again. 
throughout these four years, which only reaffirms that the police's job is to protect the interests of capital and the wealthy and not to help you. The Telegram case was the most recent inspired me to write and make this entire video. It somehow proves to be even more fucked up than Burning Sun. Founder of Telegram in France is currently facing an investigation into the messaging app's role in Korea's deep fake scandal. The preliminary investigation began on July 8th, my birthday, how, how fun, with his arrest following on the 24th of August. The company is being accused of facilitating the distribution of inappropriate images of minors as well as facilitating drug trafficking and fraud. Police are investigating all areas of this massive crime, probing eight automated programs, generating deep fake porn for these telegram groups along with the chat rooms distributing the content. Investigations come amid pressure on authorities to respond to reports detailing telegram groups some with as many as 220,000 members. The public flooded the system with 650 requests to tackle the issue, and rightfully so as these chat rooms are largely being used to deepfake images of college students, high schoolers, and even middle schoolers. According to NPR, many of the victims and perpetrators are teenagers. Of the 178 suspects the police booked during the seventh month period, 74% were ages 10 to 19, up from 65% in 2021, and more than half the deepfakes traced and erased this year by the government-run Advocacy Center for Online Sexual Abuse Victims involved minors. Experts say most suspects target individuals they know personally. They lose trust in their communities, says Jong. They fear they can no longer maintain their everyday life with the people around them. Essentially, their trust in social relationships collapses. This gives even more reasoning behind why women will make a movement like 4B. If you have so much fear and distrust with the people in your everyday life, then your method of finding liberation will reflect that cause and effect. There's even more direct evidence of radicalization and resentment in this case. Chong Daehye, a researcher at the Korean Institute of Criminology and Justice in Seoul, says most of these men are motivated by belittling women. It's a form of expressing misogyny and anger towards women. By mocking belittling them, they get affirmation from each other. I've covered deep fake porn cases before on this channel and it seems globally, institutions are falling behind on how and maybe even whether to prosecute these cases. The arrest rate in Korea for fake sexual abuse material was 48% far below the rate at which other forms of digital sexual assault are prosecuted. Analysis from South Korea broadcaster NBC shows that of the individuals who are tried in court, only about half of them get suspended sentences. Chong says the legal system still struggles to recognize sexual abuse as a serious crime with actual victims. In many cases, judges think the damage is not as severe as in sexual violence involving direct physical contact, she says. These are the same chat rooms that Tao was in. This was the mindset he had fallen into. The same level of dehumanization these other people did with such ease, he allegedly did as well. This is far reaching. This is not just some random loser holding up a phone at some protest and harassing feminists. This has expanded to real consequential harm. I try to illustrate with these videos that this is a rabbit hole. This is an ideology that has become a way of life. It permeates into the way you think, the way you interact with others, the activities you engage in. It's like a virus. It takes over you. It doesn't matter your economic status, social status, race, or orientation. None of that matters. It comes for all. There's nothing inherent about Korea that would create such a thing. Like I said, it is spreading widely all across the globe. It may look a little different depending on the makeup of the society in some places. It may be more racially focused like in America or in others like Korea, it may be more gender focused or some slew of both. But this is simply what happens when hatred and radicalization are left unchecked. When people aren't given the proper channels to better themselves or understand their growing resentment, so instead of solving it in any meaningful way, 
they find someone to blame. They ultimately lose themselves. They go from small levels of resentment to harassing women online to being members in these group chats. It sucks you in if you let it. I mean, it's, it's sad. If there's anything I've learned from covering Cryotic or Gamergate or any story like this, it's that this ideology will find and capture you. It truly is a virus. It'll take a hold of you and then it spreads to your friends and then your friends' friends and on and on and on until it's this endless cycle. The best thing I can say after researching story after story like this is never give up. And that can look different ways. That could be never give up on someone you know who has been captured by radicalization. I mean, know your limits. If they're in chat rooms doing telegram shit, then you know, maybe they're too far gone. But if they're at that starting point and you're starting to see those signs speaking through, then be reasonable voice in their life. Talk it through with them, be the angel on their shoulder. We should also never give up in a broader collective sense. Don't stop protesting or speaking out against individuals or institutions that encourage the spread of this virus. Even if it's small, it matters and could help others that you know from going deeper and deeper down this rabbit hole. So now understanding the socio-political environment a little better, all the events across nearly a decade that have led to this moment, is 4B exactly what Korea needs or is it an overreaction? While I truly don't understand where these feelings of outrage come from, wanting to completely remove yourself from the source of your oppression and pain, it ultimately doesn't solve anything. In fact, I would argue 9 times out of 10, it only makes the problem worse. 4B takes this femcell-like approach that completely casts aside men from the equation but states their ultimate goal is feminist liberation. I've spoken to this before in my Karotic video essay, but there's this mischaracterization of feminism. We often boil it down to feminism equals girl bossing or some reverse role situation, but that's not even remotely the definition. Feminism is the equality of all genders, and there's a reasoning behind that definition even if it seems far-fetched or unachievable. The goal is to rid everyone of gender-based injustices, and that includes women, men, MBs, and everyone in between. As I stated earlier, justice isn't vengeance. It's much easier to do 4B and create this absently male utopia. It makes you feel good temporarily. It makes you feel like you're saying your fuck yous, getting over all the man. But then you take a step back and you realize you didn't accomplish anything. The violence you experience still exists. Some 4Bers have reported specialized violence against them in particular. You still don't get paid enough. There is no comprehensive solution in sight. And some may say, well, maybe the pressure will cause someone to listen, but it won't. Those other sex strikes I mentioned worked almost like a targeted boycott. It has a specific goal with a specific number of participants that targeted a specific set of men. This one is just unplugging and hoping for the best. It doesn't have any specific goal. Is it targeting economic injustices, sex crimes, or issues in the justice system? It's all over the place. It reminds me of how TikTokers do BDS. They have no understanding of how boycotting works. It has to be targeted. Those sex strikes in Colombia and Liberia didn't exclude men from the conversation. I mean, to a certain extent, the men were sadly still at the center of the whole thing. The reaction still determined the outcome. You catch my drift? You smell my farts? It just ends up mimicking the same feelings as a side you're against. All that resentment and anger those men on Eelb feel, while not nearly as violent or detrimental, it's still resentment and it's still unproductive. A much better way to tackle the radicalization and crimes against women is with comprehensive legislation. If everyone in society is granted policies that help them succeed, better housing, lower cost of goods, less competition for jobs, easier access to college. If those main problems are solved in Korea, a good chunk of this resentment would go away. Everyone would get a fair shake. Now, of course, it wouldn't be completely gone. Many of these men are socialized to believe this, so it wouldn't go away overnight. And honestly, the point isn't for it to go away uh, completely. The goal is to limit it 
As I've said before, if you tackle the root cause of these issues, cut the head of the snake off, I said it right this time, then that eliminates the source. There's no vehicle with which to harbor your outrage. You are just at that point screaming into a void and look like a dickhead. Not to say any of this is easy, but doing the right thing rarely is. Korea would need leaders and a party that work to solve these issues, and it would most likely take decades to solve. But it's much more worth it to know the next generation won't have to face this violence than to fester in your outrage because it makes you feel good in the short term. I'm not trying to rag on four beers. Like I said, I get it. I really do. But as the old Greek proverb says, a society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they shall never sit in. Thank you all so much for watching. It is truly my greatest pleasure to make video essays like this. I love covering radicalization for some weird reason. I think it's fascinating to read all those different stories and you know, it doesn't matter where it is happening or who it is targeting. It all is the same. Although I do wonder if I'm covering too much serious stuff. I'm still kind of confused on what path I want to go down with my videos, which is kind of crazy to say after three years on YouTube. Like, goddamn, should have figured it out by now. But I guess the plan is to just create whatever I would want to watch, right? I suppose it doesn't have to be that deep. But I want you all to know that this is what keeps me going. Right now is the only thing that makes me feel like I have a purpose in this world and it's not like I'm a big shot. I haven't been paid by YouTube in months. I'm still far from my dream of collaborating with awesome Bobby. <laughs> I don't think I have enough clout for him so he'll never notice me but anyways. But I really don't know what I would do without YouTube. I really can't tell you. It means a lot to see all the familiar faces even if a video gets you know not that many views. I know Feisty will be there. I know Morrow will be there. I know Cole will be there and that brings me to thanking my patron members and youtube members for their continued support some of you have been members for like a year which is freaking crazy like thank you so much you really don't know how much it means you really don't but that's all for now and i will see you in the next one okay bye the video is over you can leave leave now Bye.